who don't know me, I'm Ches. Um, I do a lot of YouTube videos. That's what I do in my free time. That and drink chai tea. Mmm, refreshing. Um, so, yes, improvisation. This is one that's been requested a lot and I've been subtly putting it off. Not subtly putting it off, as in it got requested when I first started doing YouTube about three months ago. Um, and it's been continually requested, pretty much daily. It's just such a broad topic, I just don't know where to start helping you guys. Um, so I had a little thing, and for once I've actually done some homework, and instead of just um, chatting randomly, I, I have a plan. I've got a plan, man's plan. So I'm going to break it down into lots of different sections. So first of all, how to just get started and give it a go, which we'll try today. Then I'm going to do, so there's going to be a huge series of videos, but the, here are the first kind of four. Then how to sort of train up your ear because eventually you ideally want to be able to hear what you're about to play before you play it and be able to voice it on your instrument so almost like you were singing improvised singing third video how to play in all keys so there's 12 different keys that you want to be able to play in you can't be a, an improvising sax player that can only play in one key so uh we'll talk about that talk about how the keys work together and how you can learn them so it's not so daunting because i think um Certainly as a beginner, it just seems like there's an awful lot to take in with scales. And it's actually very, it's very mathematical. It's very straightforward, really. It's really a piece of cake. Uh, and the fourth video is going to be about chord changes, so you don't end up just playing one scale. So today we're just going to try, uh, like, a few notes and, and making them sound like improv. But eventually you want to be able to change chord when the piano, or whatever your harmony instrument is changing. Uh, and it just gives it a lot more direction. When I do that video, I'll do an example of both so you can hear what I'm talking about, but it, it does get a bit boring when you're only playing in one key. So, today's video, um, so you need to know your G major scale, which has an F sharp in it. I went for that key because it's, it's simple with the various things I'm gonna mess around with. So, um, G, A, B, C, D, E, F sharp, G. For the moment, just accept that it has an F sharp. In that other video, I'm talking about scales and keys. I'll explain a little bit more about why that F sharp is there and where it came from. For now, just accept that. Uh, if you're on tenor, best thing to do is probably stick in the same key as me, so stick on your G, um, just so that we've got all the same note patterns and your backing track will therefore be in A. So you want to look for blues backing track in A. And ideally, I had a little scooch around trying to find something that might be right for you guys. Um, ideally go for something slow, so if you see something that says slow blues, that's probably the ticket for you if this is your first shot at improvising. Um, and if you're just taking some advice from me and just having a listen, then you could go for something like funk or something a bit unusual, something a bit, or Latin, it's a bit interesting. Um, okay, so let's start off with that G major scale. So just familiarise yourself with the notes again. And make sure you know all your notes and you know where your F sharp is. Now, we're going to mess around with that scale. Um, let's start fairly simple. So if we take it and turn it into a pentatonic, so name does what it says on the tin, um, so we think about pentagon, five sides, we're only going to use five of those notes. So basically any of the ones that clash, when the chord's changing, we're just going to zip them out. Um, and then hopefully we won't clash so much with it. So we're going to take number one from the scale, number two from the scale, number three from the scale. We're going to cut out number four, we're not going to use him anymore. We're going to use number five and number six and get rid of number seven. So that leaves us with, if G is one, A is two, B is three, so et cetera. We've got G, A, B, skip C, D, E, skip F sharp, and then we put the octave on top. So it ends up something along the lines of this. Something like that. Um, that's a really good, actually a good scale in the first instance to have a go with. Um, and then we'll jazz it up a little bit to the kind of scale I was using at the beginning. So, um... I'm just going to disappear and find the right kind of track for that. Maybe something Latin would be good if I can find something slow. Bear with me. Okay. So what we're going to try and do is just take those first three notes, one, two, and three. Super simple, patronizingly simple. But you can actually do quite cool stuff with just those three notes. I'm just really trying not to go to other notes there. Um, and the idea is just to create something really rhythmical, lots of rhythmic interest. Um, so let's have a little play off each other for a minute. So hopefully you've got your sax ready. And um, sorry for the tenor players. 
uh, you're in the wrong key. <laughs> so, alto players, I'm gonna play a little phrase. I want you to try and answer me, just make up anything using those three notes. You can use two different octaves if you want. So here's mine. Here we go. I can't hear what you're doing at the other end. But in my experience teaching this, um, first of all, don't feel like you always have to feel the space. If you're a reading sax player, I think having the music taken away from you like this suddenly leaves you really vulnerable. So don't feel like you always have to be playing. If you flip back again after this banter, um, you'll find that I actually leave a lot of space. Uh, I think that's really, really important to take into account, um, including long notes. I only do long notes sporadically. so. Think about trying to create rhythmic interest, something punchy. That is what music's all about, really. Like, if you think about, there are bands that are purely percussion. They don't actually have any pitch whatsoever, and it still makes music, still makes a tune, you know. Um, you can make a cool tune just hitting on the pots and pans. That simplicity is key. People like repetition. Um, if you listen back to a pop song, or if you try and work out any pop songs, you'll find that there's so much repetition. Baby, you're a fire, you'll work. Same again. Come and let your colours burn. Pretty much the same thing. Make them go up. Na 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 na. Yeah, pop songs are so so repetitive, and people love it. You know, so make sure you try and put some repetition in there. So either it's a rhythmic repetition, so you've got an idea of ba 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 ba. That's your rhythmic idea, and you're going to put that over your different notes. <laughs> So you did, I did three of the same rhythm and then I changed the last one. Or you can have um, melodic repetition. So maybe I'll pick um, the G, the B, the E, the D. That's my melodic repetition. I'm going to do something uh, different with the rhythm. Yeah. So repetition, really, really important. Space, really important. Try not to just cling on and hold long notes. Unless you're doing something very melodic. But even then, I, I'm a big believer in space. Okay, so moving on from that to the scale I was using at the beginning, it's a little bit funkier. So we're going to do a minor pentatonic, and it's going to be another one of those situations where you have to accept a lot that I say uh, and not question it too much because I will be explaining a little bit more in another video. So if we go back to our G major, G, A, B, C, D, E, F, sharp, G. Um, and if you don't really understand sharps and flats and accidentals, let me know and I'll do a video on where accidentals come from and what what the hell flats and sharps are. We're going to change this into a minor pentatonic now, so that was a major pentatonic. We're going to jazz it up and we're going to add in some blue notes, which basically means we're going to flatten some of them and make them a bit funkier. A <laughs> little bit jazzier. So, um, first of all, we're going to take number one from the scale. Fine, we're good with that. G. Number three from the scale, so now we've got rid of number two. We're going straight to number three from the scale, and we're going to flatten that. So that's your B, a, uh, G, A, B. B is now going to become B flat. That's our first blue note, there's going to be two. We're going to use number four, which was C. You might want to write this down. We're going to use number five, which is D. And we're going to flatten number seven. That's where it gets a little bit odd. Because it was an F sharp, if you flatten a the sharp, they kind of cancel each other out. So we end up with a normal F. So just to go through those again, we've ended up with one, which is G, flat three, which is B flat, 
4, which is C, 5, which is D, flat 7, which is F natural, and then you have the octave on top. Now, with this, uh, we're going to do the same sort of thing again, we're going to do a little bit back and forth. And um, we're just going to talk a little bit more about phrasing this time. So, if we were to take all of those notes and think of them in terms of conversation, I would say the notes that were originally in the scale, your C and D, are almost like, almost like a comma. In fact, no, let's call them, let's call them the question mark. It's almost like, if I, if I play my little phrase and my phrase finishes on a D, and then it's your turn, it feels like I'm passing it over to you. Like I've said, hey, so how was your day? And then you go, mine was okay, how was yours? And you, if we kept finishing on Ds or Cs, we'd keep having a conversation, keep asking each other questions. Now, if you fin finish on one of those blue notes, the ones that we've messed around with, so the B flat or the F, it feels more like a comma, like there has to be something after that. It can't be sort of, today I went to the park and, Ugh. You know, there's more, there has to be more coming. You can't sort of, you can finish a phrase on one of those notes, but it's just, it will long to have more after it. So, um, so we're gonna give that a go. So we've got me, I'm phrase number one, you're phrase number two. So you can try and finish that on any of those notes and just experiment, see what it sounds like. <laughs> on a G and what it feels like to not finish on a G and hopefully when you don't finish on a G you've felt that feeling of passing it over to me. Um, now I shouted out something that was quite useful in the middle of that. Oh yeah, that's another thing that people fall into the trap of. Um, you've only got five notes, so it's not loads. We don't feel like you have to use all five every single time. What I find useful with my pupils the first time you do improvisation is to dry, write a really great G in the middle of your page and then write the other notes in a circle around it so that you're not drawn to just kind of playing them in order back and forth. Um, it ends up quite boring, you know. You can make something funky with it, but... You can make something funky, but it will quite quickly get boring. So try and separate those notes out, but also like focus on an area. So maybe aim to only use about three or four at a time rather than feel like, oh, I need to get all of those notes in. That's not that's not important at all. The main thing you're going for at this stage is just rhythmic interest and trying to create something funky. Okay, so I think that's all I've got to say on it for this moment, but definitely playing off someone else um, is really useful. You'll find the more you listen, this is something that I definitely took a long time to realise, the more you listen to sax players uh, out in the industry, the more you pick up from them, and if you have a tutor, ask them to bounce ideas off you, or just keep kind of rewinding this video back again. If you want more uh, training videos like this, write me a little comment in the description box and let me know, and I'll just do it in loads, I could do it in all 12 keys if you want, so that you've got a little call and response and I can do like a five minute video that's just me doing every four bars so that you can keep playing off someone. Uh, yeah, so next video is going to be telling you a little bit more about how I hear what I want to play and then most of the time, put it on the instrument. Sometimes I surprise myself, but nine times out of ten, uh, what I hear in my head gets realised on the instrument. So how I got to that stage, I'll talk about that in my next video, uh, upcoming, hot off the press. So yeah, thanks for watching. Really hope that was useful. As I say, it's just such a broad topic. I find it a bit intimidating trying to explain it uh, from the beginning to someone else. So I hope that was a good starter point for you. Um, if you did like it, please give us a thumbs up. I'd like that, that'd be great. Or give me some comments and things that you'd like me to do, anything else you'd like me to chat about or learn. If you haven't already subscribed, you must, please do. 
Um, and yeah, and if you want to know what I'm up to or check out more kind of photos and media and bits and bobs of me, I'm on Twitter and Instagram and all those things. So yeah, thanks everybody. Bye! Okay, no, I didn't want Bohemian Rhapsody.